What would you say are the underlying causes to illnesses? Well, you don't ask difficult questions, do you? Well, I think um, the body has its own um, reparative ability to get us toward normal. And it's all of our lifestyle choices, plus maybe some genetics and, you know, that gets us off the path toward wellness and things that can get us off the path of wellness. I mean, Mark Houston, uh, when he just, he's a head of the Hypertensive Institute, I think in Nashville, mm. he mentions there are 400 risk factors for cardiovascular disease. I suspect it's the same risk factors for dementia and everything else. And these include uh, the biggies are inflammation and oxidative stress. I'm sure there's been a lot of um, publicity about inflammation being the root of most diseases. I remember 10 years ago when they're saying, maybe there's a connection between depression and cardiovascular disease. Well, of course, you guys, they're both uh, triggered by inflammation, duh. So there's, and then the, there's all sorts of contributing factors, stress, poor sleep, lack of exercise. As Nick mentioned in his book, you know, Limitless, uh, all these things contribute. And uh, uh, lifestyle choices, toxins, um, you know, stress, it just gets the body off balance. And the body has the ability to repair and usually does so at night, it detoxifies mm. and stuff. But when we overwhelm the body with bad food, environmental toxins, EMF, stress, it's more than the body can handle. And if the body is breaking down faster than it can repair, mm. well, that's going to lead in a downward spiral. Now, where, which I mean, so which to where these illnesses will show up is depends on the person's individual weaknesses. Some people can show up in cancer, other people cardiovascular disease. But it's just that the body uh, cannot repair as fast as it's being attacked and assaulted by the various things in our environment, inclu including our food. And what would you say are the proactive steps that people can take towards optimal health? Well, you talk to any health expert, including reading Nick's book, Limitless, and they're going to start with the basics. You start with a healthy diet. You start with organic food. Um, you don't, if you're eating animals, which I highly recommend, make sure that they're grass fed because if they're not, they're going to be eating things, insecticides, hormones, antibiotics, which will harm us, or they'll eat stuff that's been sprayed with this. And um, so you got to eat, if you're eating animals, you make sure they're grass fed. If you're eating fish, make sure they're wild because farm fish, according to Joseph Pisano, who's written several books on toxins and founded Baster Naturopathic School. The worst food you can eat is farmed salmon. It's mm. got everything you can imagine. If you want some antibiotics or you want some antidepressants or any pills, farmed salmon should have them for you. So it's just a regular happy pharmacy. So you eat wild fish, organic uh, that produce um, many colors as possible. You take care of your sleep. You take care, you deal with your stress and work with it. A little bit of stress is good. There's a hermetic principle that will, you know, that will get things going in the body, but too much stress if we're overwhelmed is not good. Good sleep, good exercise. <clears throat> Every expert you have on the show, including Nick, will say the same things. And, and minimize your exposure to toxins. Mm -hmm. I was about to ask literally that question. So how would you recommend that people um, reduce the amount of toxins? Well, the film I'm editing now is called Toxified. And uh, we, our goal is just to wake people up to these toxins. But what you do is obviously minimize exposure. And mm. you don't know where the exposure is coming from. I mean, women put all this glop on their face, and I guess men do too. All those chemicals go right into the body, and they just kind of add there and accumulate. I mean, the mm. Environmental Working Group, their website is EWG, you know, www.ewg.com. I think they did studies that you take a woman who's pregnant, and they've got like uh, 200 chemicals in them, or you look at the... Um, the cord connecting the baby, and that's got all sorts of chemicals in it. Mm. And this is pretty serious because these things add up. And people don't realize they put clop on their face and fragrances. Mm. That's just a trade word that can have 100 chemicals in it, many petrochemicals, maybe even more than that. And they don't have to disclose it because of 
trade secrets. So, um, the, you know, and then, um, you know, the things you bring into your house, rugs, couches, they have flame retardants, and these are very unpleasant plastic bottles. They're going to say, well, you see all these smart, hip people in their Speedos, and they look so healthy drinking out of a plastic BPA-free bottle. Mm. But what they don't realize, all the companies say it's BPA-free, but they substitute BPS or BPF. And that's just as bad. Mm. So yeah, I would stay away from plastic. Store your food in glass containers. If it's got a plastic top, don't let it touch that top. Some people are microwaving plastic, which means they're going to get a nice plastic sauce. So stay away from plastics. Stay away from packaged foods. Most of the good foods are probably in the outside of the supermarket and not in the center. Stay mm. away from processed foods, anything that comes in a box. Cans have BPA. I mean, you just have to eat organic and tr- and be first thing is to be aware like tom o'brien in his book says just try to be aware of one thing at a time one week just learn about one thing and eliminate it then learn about another thing and eliminate it what are you putting on your hair what are you putting on your face what's in the carpet you're bringing in and so it's minimizing the toxins then what to how to get rid of them um that's you know a lot of people recommend chelation and personally i don't feel comfortable with it sarah myhill who I interviewed on my uh, podcast, uh, Occupy Health. She has a she goes through all the steps and you know and recommends ways to detox. I mean, sweating uh, will get rid of a lot of them. I mean, saunas, sweating, and you make sure you wipe yourself off afterwards to get the chemicals off your skin. Um, you know, so it's minimizing exposure and then maybe you know sweating. Uh, some sometimes you can take certain things. To help get rid of them, but first thing is to minimize exposure. And EMF, I mean, okay, it's two toxins that just scream at me. Mm. One of them is glyphosate, which is associated with GMO foods. Now, I've interviewed or talked to either the families or the people that did the major GMO research, genetically modified food, that is. Mm. And they found that just the genetically modified foods are causing problems and tumors. But you add glyphosate, which is a chemical found in Roundup, that's causing all sorts of problems. It's disrupting the gut. It's disrupting cellular communication between the cells. It's opening up the blood-brain barrier. Um, it, the, the Monsanto people say it doesn't affect the body, but it affects bacteria on the shikimate pathway in the gut. And if that's not working, we can't make the tertiary amines, which include the neurotransmitters and, and it, it affects the detox system. So you can't detox and get things out of your body. Glyphosate, but it's in all of our food. In the U.S., it's an organic food. It's everywhere. We can't get rid of it. It's found in the Arctic. And so it opens up the blood-brain barrier. With the blood, be, brain open up, all sorts of bad chemicals can go in. And that can start an inflammation process with the microglial cells. That's really hard to stop. EMF, same thing. Interf- interferes with intercellular communication, opens up the blood-brain barrier, opens up the gut barrier. Gut is crucial in health. Nick, did you have anything to add on that? And what? I- I did. I was going to ask Susan about the impact of glyphosate, but she already covered it, which is brilliant. Susan, when I, you know, I think we had some conversations when we first met around some of my views around EMFs, because I was taking a very, I guess, more of a moderate approach in terms of, you know, coming from a technology background, you know, I love I love technology. I love the whole Internet of Things. And when I've previously been challenged by people around, you know, prove to me, Nick, that EMFs have some kind of some kind of harmful effects, I've quoted the work of Dr. Martin Paul. I've really found it difficult to find any sort of meaningful studies out there that really that, that really demonstrate you know, the harmful impacts of EMFs. Are you able to signpost any of those? Uh, look at Hardell's studies in Sweden. He's done studies that there is a dose-related effect to the exposure of cordless phones, which are just as bad as cell phones and cellular phones, to having acoustic neuromas uh, and glioblastomas in the brain. So his studies. The U.S. just did a study, the toxicology study. I'm told that they spent uh, $30 million and took 20 years. It showed that there was a connection with brain tumors, a glioblastoma, and schwannomas of the heart. I don't know why, and this was 
commissioned by the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration. This is the information I have. I could be wrong. The Food and Drug Administration. Why are we not hearing about this? Suleiman in Turkey and Hugh Taylor at Yale did independent studies, putting a cell phone on the abdomen of a pregnant animal. The offspring all had brain changes, especially in the hippocampus, which is the first thing to go mm. in dementia. Um, there have been studies of men putting it in the pocket that their sperm are defective and, and less and, you know, fewer of them. I mean, it's cheaper than a vasectomy, guys, so go for it. But <laughs> the studies are out there. The problem is, in, and you're going to find this in every area, that the, the industry will inundate you with all sorts of studies, but a lot of them are poorly done. And, uh, you know, they, the, the industry studies say there's no problem. But on the other hand, the um, independent studies, at least two thirds of them show there's a problem. So um, the research is there, but the movement to bury this, I mean, the things that Monsanto has done, I mean, mm. uh, incredible. Um, if you see my movie, The Big Secret, which apparently U.S. Congress does not want people to see because it's about nutrition and health. So God forbid that information get out. But I interviewed Dr. Seralini in France, and he was saying all the awful things that Monsanto did to try to destroy his reputation. Interviewed the Pustai family, and I'm sure you're familiar with Pustai there in England, right? No, I'm not, sorry. <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> Pustai, um, on, when he was about to publish his research, <clears throat> I think it's the Rowan Institute in Scotland or something, <clears throat> Monsanto called up Clinton, who called up Tony Blair and said to silence the guy. And they did. They burglarized his house. This is also in the film, The Big Secret. They burglarized his house. They took all of his materials. They took all of his study materials. They fired everybody. And um, and, and so they didn't want the word out. They the, the, you know, so they silenced them effectively. So, I mean, the, with the companies, um, their research is biased. I mean, mm. it, it, when the Monsanto papers, it's come out that they knew about some of these things. And that's why there was a recent judgment here in California that one couple was awarded, was it $2 billion? A and the Environmental Protection Agency, which is going to protect us in the U.S., well, on my podcast, Occupy Health, I've interviewed uh, E.G. Valianatos, and he worked for them for 25 years. There never were any studies on the insecticides. There was a bogus lab that did two months of studies and made up the data. So any data supporting the use of you know some of these chemicals in agribusiness were false. And, and the FDA, uh, there were scientists, I've got the memos that warn, do not do this genetically modified foods. We need more information first. At least let's get more information. The FDA went, the Food and Drug Administration went ahead with it anyway. Also looking at the Food and Admin Drug Administration, I'm told that, um, you know, when it came to our Spartane, that, you know, the Food and Drug Administration knew that it was carcinogenic. They knew that it caused cancers. And yet, um, this, I forget the name of the guy, but there is some big politician that was paid to get it passed by the FDA, uh, Food and Drug Administration. It's in a lot of your beverages in London. It's a known carcinogen. It is a neurotoxin. And they, the Food and Drug Administration knew this when um, it was it Donald Rumsfeld was a guy. Donald Rumsfeld was paid to push it through. And so you're drinking it in the hospital I work in. All the beverages last spring had a Spartan in it. I mean, what's, I mean, do you trust the research coming out of industry? Mm -hmm. Where can people get trusted information from, Susan? Well, I mean, you know, everybody's talking about false news. I mean, my film, The Big Secret, mm. has been censored. We were on Amazon mm. Prime doing fine. And then Congressman Adam Schiff, who's very busy going after our uh, um, the major tweeter in the U.S. right now. But he I asked Jeff Bezos of Amazon to remove a lot of documentaries. Mine, The Big Secret, was one of them. It's now mm. on Vimeo Prime. But... And, and a lot of documentaries like um, the Brzezinski cancer documentary, uh, that was taken off. It's, it's just, uh, it, I mean, they used the issue of vaccines as a Trojan horse to come in and censor whatever they want. I am told that Google is making it very hard to find information on health. Uh, Joseph Mercola, Kelly Brogan, Sayer G, 
They were all bloggers on health. Used to be you put in psychoneuroimmunology. Kelly comes up on the first page. Now she's on page 23. What's going on? Why are they making it difficult to find information of alternative um, information on health? I think to get accurate information, I think you're just going to have to search. It's, I mean, your program and other programs, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's going to be really hard because the information is being buried. In the U.S. and universities, same thing. Why is it being buried, Susan? You, you have to answer that question. I don't know the answer. But I can't think of any scenarios that's going to make me very happy. Oh, but if you answer that question... Right now, the U.S. FBI has declared if you answer that question with anything other than, oh, this is just an accident, then you're a domestic terrorist, according to the FBI. So uh, all I'm going to do is ask the questions. But why they're doing it, I mean, I mean, you, you connect the dots. Mm. I, I don't know. And, if I, and I've, I've got guesses, but I'm not going to say. <laughs> It's really interesting, Susan, because we were, the three of us were at the Health Optimization Summit that happened in London. And for me, this came across as a really big theme in the opening morning, mm. where there were lots of people on stage saying that, you know, we have got a message that we want to give out to the world, yet a number of people are now being censored on some of the major search engines. So I think mm. that, I think, I think for me personally now, I'm using alternatives to Google, such as Bing or DuckDuckGo, to try and find the information that I want, because I really feel as though, you know, it's my decision. If I want to, if I want to research something that is unconventional to normal medicine, or I want to really find out the root cause of, you know, why something happens, and I wanted to understand what's going on with me from a biological root cause point of view. It should be my right to be able to find the information and mm -hmm. it the way for me. I agree. I don't know why they're doing this. I mean, if somebody gets cancer and they want to find alternative approaches to add to their primary regimen with their physician, why are they not getting that information? Mm -hmm. Why? Are, why the you know Boris Johnson in his first. 15 minutes comes out and first 30 minutes of his speech is pushing GMOs at the same time Google is making it hard to find information why and Trump is pushing it as well of course Boris Johnson had some very interesting things to say about 5G hmm. I mean what he said was really gutsy <laughs> I mean the safest thing to say is just a natural extension of greed yeah I mean that's probably safe to say People have other theories, and in my upcoming movie, Toxified, they say these other theories. Mm. But I'm just going to say the best case is that it's a natural extension of greed. Can you, um, can you expand on the um, 5G point, if that's okay, in terms of what your view is? Uh, 5G has got all the – I've interviewed a lot of experts on it, and 5G has got all the frequencies in it. A couple of experts told me that the military has been studying this for years and they know exactly what frequencies can cause what conditions or what mm -hmm. illnesses. And, and then there's all sorts of things that sound too uh, difficult for me to imagine. I mean, it goes beyond that. But uh, uh, frequencies can cause which illnesses. Also, 5G, you can use it uh, for um, surveillance. You mm -hmm. could be in the middle of a building with no Wi-Fi or anything and they could come in and uh, my dog's here to say hello. And they could monitor what you're doing. There's this film that I saw in the UK done by ITV called The Chinese Digital Gulag. And they, uh, they, they were able to monitor facial expressions, what people were saying every second. And if the government didn't like it, they sent, usually this was against the Wigan people, they would send them to education camps, which um, don't sound as enlightening as they might be because people can't get out of them and they've got two million people in there just because they don't like a facial expression or something people are saying that is the where what it can do mm. now any anything you do use electricity atoms it can be used for good or for bad mm. it's just i'm questioning the uh intention <laughs> of <laughs> I'm quite, yeah, you can put that in. I'm questioning the, you know, is our, does a government have our best interest? I mean, if Donald Rumsfeld gets paid heavily to put our Spartan 
in food supplies and you folks in Europe have it too, do they have our best interest at heart? Um, the, uh, Congress, it appears that they're bought off by big industry. I mean, they're, I mean, in the U.S., you, I mean, they're making it very difficult to find out genetically modified materials in what we eat. Why mm-hmm. are they do, doing this? But also you can look up online something called active denial. They can use it for cr- crowd control. They can just beam it at people and it makes their skin burn. Uh, I mean, sure, and people, you know, law enforcement should have that. I don't mind that. But with all the studies of what it can do, um, you know, I mean, I mean, I've heard someplace that, you know, they can beam at somebody in the audience and target them. But I've heard in places as, po- as postula- postulated that they'll be able to do it through your cell phone in the future. I mean, something, I, I mean, if you trust your government, fine. But um, what I've seen, like with Spartan and pushing GMOs on us and 5G, uh, I have to question. I think, Susan, for me, there's a, you know, I think lots of the audience will be listening to us talking, thinking. Some of them will be thinking, really? Is this just a conspiracy theory? You know, are these things like oh, real? You can't, say, you can't say that. You'll be a domestic terrorist. You can't I'm, in the, I'm in the UK, so I can't, I'm fine. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you can't say it, but I can. Do you think we're not exporting all of our stuff to the UK once Brexit happens? <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, there is a that. year ago, they, there were more lobbyists, US lobbyists in Europe than in the US, and they had approached every member of parliament, I heard, as of before a year ago. Mm. Don't well, I think, think you're not in their sights. <laughs> but I think if we go back in history... Okay, so so things that people can relate to. The things that jump out to me as things that were okay for us or good for us in the past that have been proved wrong are things like tobacco, things like margarine. um, Asbestos. Asbestos, yeah. So, so, you know, so there there is history in us being told that things are good for us. And then, as things transpire over time, we find out mm. that they aren't. And I think so. So, all I would say to the audience is keep an open mind. Mm. Do your own research. You know, try and find like the pros and cons on the internet, and make up your own mind. Because, and don't just dismiss it because we're talking about things that are quite might be deemed controversial. They're controversial. Changing the subject slightly, can you talk us through <laughs> cholesterol and heart diseases? So, in terms of cause and effect, um, there was a, first of all, cholesterol is not identified as causing heart disease because people who have heart attacks, half of them have normal cholesterol. Mm-hmm. The statins apparently do not protect against heart attacks. They might restructure the plaque and do some good things and a little bit of antioxidant properties. But I I don't think that studies show that they protect against heart attacks. I mean, I've got some memos that was in my film, The Big Secret, where the sugar industry was, you know, trying to strongly influence Harvard researchers to come out with the conclusion they wanted, which was fat is the problem. Mm -hmm. So we went, you know, through several decades thinking fat is the culprit and eating margarine and stuff. And so what do they do? They take the fat out of various products and they're going to add sugar. Well, Robert Lustig has come out and saying, wait a minute, you know, sugar is, you know, partially the culprit here. Um, I mean, we make 80% of our cholesterol. So if you've got high cholesterol, maybe the question should be is why is your cholesterol high? Mm. You know, but I mean, like the work of Mark Houston and Robert Lustig, they're both in my film, The Big Secret. They're they're looking at that. No, this fat thing is not correct. There's some people like Western Price Organization that that believe that eating meat is great. But if you eat a lot of meat, you know, that'll raise your insulin level just as if you eat a lot of sugar. So what they say to that is to eat fat with it. But if you're going to eat the fat with the meat, it's got to be organic because that's where all the toxins are stored. So, I mean, there's a big push, and I think the sugar industry was involved, to identify fat as the culprit. I also heard that the U.S. at one point was threatening to take all of the money out of WHO, 
World Health Organization if they tried to lower the recommended uh, daily amount of sugar from 25 grams to 10. I mean, there's been a lot of studies showing that sugar is causing a lot of damage to our health. Mm -hmm. And I don't see our health as having improved since uh, the low fat materials come out. There's been several books on this. I think a guy named Feynman wrote about it and Robert Lustig talks about it, etc. But the cholesterol theory of causing heart attacks is, you know, it's no longer, I mean, among the experts, it's no longer what they're looking at. I mean, the body responds to any stressor, as I was saying, Mark Houston has identified like 400 things can, can, are risk factors for heart attacks. You say the same thing for dementia. And any one of these insults, toxins, inflammation, oxidative stress, poor sleep, can set the back body in certain pathways where you build up atherosclerotic plaque in the arteries and you're on your way. So, I mean, it's just, it just been uh, proven wrong. I mean, if you, you can eat fats, but they've got to be healthy fats. You don't mm. want to eat vegetable oils. They're highly processed, usually in plastic bottles, which is making it worse. Eat, I mean, canola oil or rapeseed oil, highly processed, even though Whole Foods says it's organic. Um, a lot of it with genetically modified foods. So I think if somebody was pushing to make fat the demon, and we're finally unraveling that. I get Gary Pat Taubes also wrote a book, Good Calories, Bad Calories. So there's a lot of people that are becoming aware of this. But the fat causing heart disease, um, there, there are new theories that are replacing that. Why do you think that we're not making enough energy in our bodies? Well, when you talk about energy, you think of mitochondria. And uh, when you think of mitochondria, anything going wrong in the body you know, inflammation, oxidative stress, um, you know, is going to impact the mitochondria. So, uh, I, you know, that's an individual thing. Uh, I, I assume we've got enough energy. I mean, maybe we need more energy. Maybe we're using more than we have. Um, but, you know, it's going to deal with mitochondria and how healthy the body is. Nick, did you have a question around that at all? Not such a question, but I think I fully support what Susan's saying in terms of, you know, anything you can do to enhance mitochondrial function mm. and anything you can do to protect them. And I think a lot of what Susan's been talking about in terms of the impact of toxins mm. they directly impact mitochondria. So I'm, I'm a big believer of you need to power them up and then you need to protect them too. Well, I mean, uh, certain people recommend certain supplements like uh, carnitine, which helps, I think, carry, you know, material into the mitochondria, uh, CoQ10, which is very important, but statins will deplete that. So mm. you take a statin, you're going to get muscle pain, feeling weak, etc. Statins also deplete adiponectin, and they also affect the myelin around the nerves. But anyway, so if you're taking a statin, you should uh, take CoQ10 with it. Um, glutathione. I mean, there's various pe people have various recommendations for supporting the mitochondria. What role does gluten play in the diet, Susan? Gluten. Um, well, um, it is more controversy. Um, <laughs> if you listen to Tom O'Brien, he'll say that the body cannot does not have enough enzymes to break gluten down. I and mean, it's like a necklace. You can get it down to clumps, but you can't get it down to each individual bead because we mm. don't have the enzymes. That's his theory that nobody can digest it. Okay. Um, so um, if you have a undigested protein, I mean, this can happen because a toxin atta attaches itself to it. And uh, so you've got this clump of something. And if you've got a leaky gut, gut is essential. This is a paw coming at me from my dog. Uh, so if you've got, uh, <laughs> so if you've got gluten, so if you've got an undigested protein and a leaky gut, it's, and most of us do have leaky guts, an airplane ride will make your gut a little leaky. So this will uh, go out in the bloodstream, and the you know your immunity system says, "Hey, wait a minute, there's a foreigner. Mount up the forces. Let's go attack this." So they create antibodies against this protein. But in the uh, issue of gluten, uh, gluten is very similar genetically to thyroid and to um, the, the 
uh, islet cells in the pancreas and also into the Purkinje cells, which are the balance cells in the cerebellum. So these can be attacked. There's something called gluten ataxia, where people are wobbling and they can't walk. And some, in some cases, you remove the gluten and that goes away. There's some, a lot of people with thyroiditis, so we've got antibodies against the thyroid, also called Hashimoto's disease. Uh, a lot of them have antibodies to uh, gluten. And, and also, it was one form of diabetes. It used to be, okay, you need insulin, that's diabetes one. Oh, you, maybe you don't need insulin developing later in age, that's diabetes two. There's now something called diabetes 1.5 or LADA, L-A-D-A syndrome. And what this is, is you get antibodies attacking the islet cells of your pancreas. So, uh, and gluten, because it's so similar to the islet cells, can be behind this. So, there's some interesting things going on with your writing there. So, um, what happens is a person can be very skinny, like yourself. They go, you go in and your sugars are high and you've got insulin mm -hmm. resistance. And the doctor will say, wait a minute, you don't fit uh, having insulin resistance. You're, you know, you're healthy, your blood pressure's okay, what's going on here? And it could be because you've got these antibodies uh, going after your islet cells, and that's measured by something called GAD67. And, you know, and what that'll do, th these people will end up on insulin like within five years because, you know, their islet cells that produce the insulin are being destroyed. Mm -hmm. So gluten can be behind that. Is everybody going to be affected? Is everybody going to notice the symptoms? No, probably not. Um, I'm told the gluten in Europe is not as harmful or as processed as that in the U.S. Um, I mean, so, some people, I mean, I know I've got a sensitivity to it, but I don't have any symptoms. Mm. So, I'm very similar, Susan, in that I've definitely got a sensitivity. And I definitely get a bit more bloated. But I've also found that as I've done more work to try and repair my gut, because I probably had probably best part of 40 years of eating whatever I wanted. So as I repair my gut, I've noticed I'm less sensitive. So mm. maybe I've got less of a leaky gut and then maybe, yeah. maybe therefore, you know, the gluten is causing less of a problem. So I think I, I, fully, I fully agree with you view that it just affects some people in different ways. Yeah, I, I agree. Not everybody is going to react to it. I mean, according to Tom O'Brien, we all act react to it, and it's causing problems with, uh, with all of us. And each person has to make their own decision on that. I mean, you know, when I see a tasty piece of gluten in front of me, it's kind of hard to resist. <laughs> But um, on gluten, um, I mean, I think it probably affects all of us, but each person has to make their own choice. I mean, there's so many things we take in and toxins that are going to affect us badly. And with a leaky gut, I mean, that's a setup. But once you've got these undigested proteins in the body, it's going to be a setup for autoimmune disease because you because it's going to be something called molecular mimicry that, okay, you're going after this food, but it's similar to this organ, so you're going to get antibodies against that organ and attack itself. And autoimmune diseases are huge in the Western world. <laughs> so, Susan, what is the environmental impact on health? Well, as I was saying, it's huge. Um, you know, the toxins, uh, I mean, the the quality of the air, the quality of the water. It's interesting because there's a movie and a lot of issues about the lead in the water supply of Flint, Michigan. Mm. And I'm told that Oakland has lead levels just as high and several cities in New Jersey have lead levels just as high. I mean, so these things affect uh, everything in our environment affects us. I mean, all the stress, all the toxins and stuff that are everywhere. And that, that, that will impact health. I mean, they can, you know, and they don't do it just through one mechanism. There's a lot of mechanisms and they're synergistic. So, the, you know, somebody might say, well, a little bit of this toxin really won't hurt you. But mm. then you've got a little bit of a lot of toxins and they all act differently. For example, for diabetes, one toxin, you know, might act on the receptors and another toxin, my dog is moving the camera, and another uh, toxin will uh, do something else. And they're synergistic. It's not just an issue that, oh, a little bit of a toxin won't hurt you because you add them all together and mm. they're doing all sorts of things. 
I mean, it used to be on a tube of toothpaste that it said, you know, that if you that kid has more than a tablespoon of it, you have to call poison control. What's that all about? Mm -hmm. Susan, what's your view around epigenetics? So I'm a fan of, of Bruce Lipton and uh, I mean. I'm a believer. I mean, epigenetics means that you can turn uh, genes on or off, a methylation, et cetera. Mm. And, you know, you can have certain genes going and certain genes turned off, the bad ones turned off and the good ones going. Mm. And apparently you could pass this on to um, your offspring. So, yeah, I mean, healthy lifestyles can get the epigenetics going in your favor. I mean, there are people with high risk factors for all sorts of horrible diseases, but, you know, they can take steps to minimize the effects. What, what do you think about the power of the subconscious and that having effects on, on our I'm makeup? a great believer in the spiritual and the higher power. I, um, you know, I think that getting in touch with that can be useful. I mm. mean, for example, there's this guy, Emoto, that's, I mean, this isn't subconscious, but it's interesting, that he, he looked at the structure of water. Mm. And if you, you know, play nice music or, or put it on the word love, the structure is very clear. Mm. You put it on the word hate or a picture of Hitler, the structure is very disruptive, negative. So there's a lot of things that are beyond what we can see that can affect us. I mean, I don't know how purely structured water affects us, but there are things bigger than we can see. And the problem with the subconscious is we don't know what it's doing because mm. consciously we might be very positive and everything's wonderful, but underneath we could have our subconscious sabotaging us. Well, I'm not worth this. My parents told me I was a pile of poo, so I've got to prove them right. I mean, we don't know what our subconscious is doing, but I do believe that the subconscious, conscious, spiritual connection can have a large effect. But I don't know how to use that to help people get well. I mean, it's just, you know, an interesting dimension. Sure. Do you think in general medicine we're treating the cause or the symptoms? You know the answer to that. <laughs> um, come on, why you ask me that? Um, I think with a 10-minute doctor appointment, how can you be looking at the cause? Mm. Uh, somebody hands out a statin, and what is it trying to do? It's lowering your cholesterol, um, and that high cholesterol is a symptom. But we need cholesterol. We need it for our hormones. We need it for our uh, cell walls. I mean, we need cholesterol. We don't want it too low. So they are treating symptoms, um, got high blood pressure. That's a symptom of something gone wrong. So, I mean, I believe in looking underneath the hood and finding the cause. There is a movement that's in the UK and the US right now called functional medicine. They go one step toward that because they are looking at the cause. They do something called the, uh, no, what is it, urine uh, acid something test. And you could look at all the pathways and how they're doing. And then you can figure out from that, well, what supplements and minerals and amino acids are needed to make these work better. And you can find out 20 years ahead of time if somebody's on a good path or not. So functional medicine is certainly going that direction. But as an example, uh, there's a clinician I go to in London, Anthony Haynes, and I think the world of him. I mean, for me, you know, things start going south and, you know, sugars get wonky and things get wonky. And so I went to him. And for me, what it was is Epstein-Barr virus was stirring up a storm. I mean, any doctor can measure Epstein-Barr virus, but there's apparently a test in Germany to see if they're causing any damage. So, but most doctors don't know about the tests in Germany. They don't know. Um, you know, how to test if the, a particular virus is causing damage. And even if they did know, they wouldn't know what to do about it. So, and this is a criticism I have with, at least in America, when they just get out a pill and they don't care. Well, not, that's the wrong word. Strike that. And they're not approaching the underlying causes in the whole 10 minutes that are allocated to talk to you. I don't think that's good enough. We need, we need to look at why these things are happening. Not just, I mean, I believe the pills mask the symptoms and create new ones. Mm. I don't want my boss listening to this. <laughs> <laughs> um, building on that, what, what percentage of diseases do you think are preventable? Oh, I can't answer that. I mean, maybe it's an issue that 
you get the diseases 20 years later if you're doing things right. Uh, uh, just, I mean, on my nonprofit, the Silicon Valley Health Institute, we've got a guy, Avi Briskowitz, who's going to be talking uh, next week. Mm. And what he says is that the longevity, looking at the people who live a long period of time, it's a, they get the same diseases, except they get it in their 90s rather than their 50s. I mean, you've got to look at our health and say something is going the wrong direction. People are getting very sick very quickly. People, the BCD rate is rising. In kids, the BCD rate is rising. Diabetes is rising. Uh, there was a study for the millennials that uh, this is a, that they're going to, you know, when they hit 27 or 28, that's the peak age, and they're going to start getting more unhealthy at that point. So the point where things are noticeable is getting, <clears throat> that people are getting younger and younger. And to me, um, me it, to, I mean, I, I think the answer is look at the environment, look at mm. the, the food, look at the stress, look at the toxins, the EMF. I mean, that is causing problems according to the various research. Um, look at the glyphosate. I mean, people are getting sick a lot sooner. So, I don't know about preventing diseases. I mean, the, that's the natural course of the body, but maybe we can delay them a couple of decades. Mm. I mean, interestingly, as Dale Bredesen is looking at reversing this cognitive symptoms of Alzheimer's. And what does he do? He looks at all the contributing factors, takes the biggest eight factors, and addresses them. And people, are, their, their cognitive difficulties are being reversed in his studies. Um, now, he has uh, delineated, uh, I think, five types of Alzheimer's. One of them is toxins, caused by toxins, which is the harder one to treat. One is, uh, I guess they'd call it metabolic, where your insulin resistance goes up. Another is that the anabolic uh, processes, which means building up, is weaker than the catabolic processes, which is tearing apart. But he's reversing all these things. So all these different things can uh, that are contributing um, – I think a lot of people can delay the illnesses by 20 years. I can't predict. Uh, there's no studies on this. I don't even know if they can do them. But mm -hmm. why is it when you're 27, your health is starting to go down? When I was a kid, I thought it was going to be, well, I thought it was really 30, but I guess it was more like 50 than mm -hmm. your health was 60. But, I mean, something's going wrong, and you have to look at the environment. How does money fit in with all of this? I don't know if you can answer that or if that's a fair question. Well, I mean, it is a very interesting question. I mean, um, you know, uh, where are all these toxins coming from? Um, a lot of them, some industrial products, some of them are very good and people love their little gadgets and they love to download cat videos quickly and they love to be able to put smelly stuff on their body because they think that makes them really hot. But you know, I mean, natural, I mean, I'm a capitalist and I believe in capitalism. So the corporations are going to try to give people what they want. Mm. And, and, and it's, it, a capitalist would try to do it as cheaply as possible. But on the other hand, if, I mean, everything's got good and bad. I, what, I mean, people need to be aware of what uh, damage, whatever these products are causing. So money, I mean, I believe in capitalism. It motivates people to do things. It motivates people to work. It motivates people to find something to meet a particular demand. But when it gets out of control, like I think when we've got glyphosate and somehow or other the corporations have the U.S. government pushing this on people and they're pushing 5G on us. I mean, there have never been any studies anywhere to show that 5G is safe or EMF is safe. None. But if you have one study raising questions, shouldn't you pay attention to that? So I think money, you know, I mean, I think it's the extension of corporate greed that you've got, you know, glyphosate all over the planet and 5G is going to be all over the planet. And the this age which diseases show up is going to be sooner. Money is kind of a big motivation. I mean, you mm -hmm. can't eat without it. You can't have a place to live without it. So the people can figure that out. It just uh, when the desire for money is extreme, and um, and and Congress is supporting uh, that. Um, I mean, you know, money. You know, none. Of, you know, money is an exchange. That's the way we get things. We buy things. We sell things. We you know get paid. It just you know it's just the medium that 
And yeah, it's it's not the money that's the problem. It's the mm. greed for money that's the problem. Mm. Is there a difference between research and what doctors are actually doing, in your opinion? Uh, you, you look at any study, and what the doctors recommend is usually 15 to 18 years behind uh, what the research is. Uh, and that's just the way it's been. I mean, I mean, way back when, I mean, when a guy came up and said, oh, you got you, washing your hands, you should do that. They tried to ostracize him. When somebody came up and said, well, ulcers are caused by H. pylori, I think he was ostracized. So when you come up with something, even with the research, there's usually resistance. But it's always a factor of 15 to 18 years between the research and what the doctors are doing. Mm. Is there something that's driving that? That I say it's more than a lag, 18 year difference. Well, I think people have to be convinced. They've got to be convinced in all levels. Mm. Um, this could just be, uh, you know, uh, stickiness and inertia in any system. And, you know, I mean, when you learn something and you know it well, I mean, and then somebody says this is wrong, you've got to do it another way, there's always some resistance mm. on the individual and more so on the bigger levels. I, I, I mean, yeah, I think, you know, vitamin D seemed to be accepted fairly quickly. I mean, I remember five years ago, a colleague of mine was ostracized for ordering it all the time. She just told her boss, look, if my patients do worse, you know, tell me about it. And she didn't hear anything more. So vitamin D uh, as a prescribed supplement is caught on very quickly. So, I mean, I think the doctors want to do the right things. Mm. I don't know why they're not questioning and wanting to find the cause of illness. I don't know, but I think they're well intended. I think you're right, Susan. You know, the point you raised, if you go and see a GP in the UK, you get five minutes. Mm-hmm. You know, and there's, there's very little that they can do with you in five minutes. And unfortunately, they then have to treat the symptom rather than the cause. So as, as you rightly mentioned, I, I'd highly recommend everybody that has some kind of condition to seek out a functional medical doctor and work with them to try and understand the tests they need to take mm. to really get to the root of what's what's going on. So I think a lot of these things out there that are sort of unknown illnesses where the doctors can't explain it, probably a lot of them do go back to lifestyle factors. I agree. So just finally, Susan, are there three tips that you could give our listeners So for executives in terms of how to improve their professional or personal performance? Eat organic, uh, meaning don't eat packaged foods, eat the rainbow, meats have to be grass-fed, fish, wild. Uh, Minimize exposure to toxins. EWG, -EWG www.ewg.org, I think, is a great source that you can look up on any particular product and see, you know, what the toxins are in it and what they think about it. And also, I would like people to be aware of what's going on with censorship. Mm. I mean, my film, The Big Secret, was censored off of Amazon Prime at the request of a congressman, Adam Schiff. And there's some things going on. I think we need to be awake because in America, we're all focused on the circus in Washington, D.C., and we're not noticing what's going on. We're distracted. So be aware of what's going on. Um, Eat healthily and minimize uh, toxins, of course, exercise, sleep, and everything that Nick says in his book, Limitless. He's <laughs> right on. He's done his research. Thank you, Susan. <laughs> I'd like to thank Susan for her time and insights. Do check out Susan on her social channels. Friendly reminder, do visit www.upgradedexecutive.com forward slash subscribe, and we will send you a special link so you can access the videos one week before we officially release them. You can also follow us on all social channels at Connect with UE and our website www.upgradedexecutive.com.